Hello there. The cover picture for today is a picture of joy, of joyful dancing. You know, a picture like that, a picture of people just so glad to be together, treasuring being with one another. That's where today's Bible study begins. Actually, that's where our Bible studies in reality begin, because it's always just a joy for us to gather together. But, you know, even for you who are simply watching online or perhaps catching up because you weren't able to be there yesterday, it's really important for us to be able to, to find joy in having a, a common thread to hold on to, a common cause to be part of, and not just any kind of common cause, a, a cause that God invites us to be part of that Christ has given us to be part of. This is a glorious gift of God, his living word, the power of his spirit. So let's read the Bible together. Shall we pray? I thank you, Father. Thank you for this opportunity to read your word. Thank you for all that we are given to understand. Thank you that there will be yet more for us to delve into to return to, to ponder in time to come. But even now, we pray, may riches be ours. May your glory be revealed, even to us, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Well, I'm going to... Uh, I don't think I'm going to stick just with the picture. I think I better have the text as well. So where we left it last week uh, in this little series of reading through uh, the book of Acts was at the point where Peter had given this very powerful sermon on the back of a rather extraordinary day in which the uh, Holy Spirit coming upon really quite a number of people enabled communication, communication in all sorts of different languages and tongues that people could understand communication not just in general but communication in particular of the of the glories and the wonders of what God had done and Peter's sermon is all about what God had done through Jesus Christ and how the people he was speaking to had been alas unable to understand at the right time and they had been complicit in the putting of Jesus to death and it ended with the people saying frankly what shall we do and Peter replying, as you see at the top of that slide, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus' name, Jesus' very special place in the whole purposes of God. Jesus' accomplishment of the forgiveness of sins through his death on the cross. Peter wanted these people to receive that. And... We talked a fair bit about that last week. In verse 40, he's talking about how, with many other words, he warned them, pleading them to save themselves from this corrupt generation, to set themselves aside from all that they were otherwise part of. And uh, in this world in which we live, there are so many things that could drag us away from our confidence in God. So many things that could drag us away from our uh, uh, from our trust in the God who directs us, who, who chastens us, who forgives us, who leads us into truth. And again and again, I think we need to take very seriously, actually, how uh, for all that Christ has done for us, we ourselves, if we're not careful, take ourselves down yet again the wrong path. And uh, Peter urges his people to take very seriously the, the turnaround of life that Jesus Christ opens to us, the, the new way of life that is Christian. Well, the great thing is that many people accepted his message. 3,000 were added to their number that day. And as we read on, what we're going to hear is actually how these 3,000 plus the 120 odd or however many there were, uh, how they really got going uh, in uh, in anchoring themselves in that mode of trust and that mode of joy, that picture that I showed you earlier. Uh, how did they how did they do it? And well, at first they they were doing things like this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, no, don't want to make a big meal of, of grammar, but this whole paragraph is really pretty well written in the what we call the imperfect tense, the present or the continuous past. Uh, and in, a, in other words, it's really kind of almost little um, uh, examples almost, or, or cameos of what kind of things were going on. They were doing things like, well, they were certainly devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching because what the apostles had to witness uh, about Jesus was critical for them to hear, as it's indeed critical for people in 2024 to hear how those first witnesses of Jesus told his story. They devoted themselves to fellowship. Now, fellowship is a very important word for us in church, although it's certainly not just a church word nowadays. But you know what fellowship really is essentially about is the sharing of ourselves with others. Now, that might mean the sharing of ourselves over a cup of coffee. It might mean the sharing of ourselves through deep spiritual conversations. It might mean the sharing of ourselves through the sharing of material goods. Actually, we're going to hear a little bit about that almost in the next sentence. All kinds of things can make up fellowship. It isn't necessarily being terribly pious or terribly uh, seriously religious, although it can include that. Fellowship is all kinds of uh, things, actually. It literally means, well, being in the same boat, having things in common, singing from the same hymn sheet, being in, in harmony with one another, spending time with one another, being committed to one another. It's a very rich word, a rather glorious thought. And again and again in, in the New Testament, we are reminded how precious it was that Christians, for all that personally and individually they were called to follow Christ, were also called together to be with others. Maybe just with one other, maybe with 10 or 15 others. Fellowship can be in many different modes. <laughs> what else were they devoted themselves to? The breaking of bread. Now, there's a little bit of a cashew there, a little bit of a, a hint there that they were remembering how Jesus broke bread for them. But to break bread in that world, well, whenever you share food, you break bread. That's what bread does. It needs to be broken up. Uh, and no such thing as sliced bread in those days. In fact, the loaves were just big flat bits of bread. So if you were going to share bread around, you would break it. You would have a meal together. Again, just in a, a sentence or two, we're going to have that spelt out for us. Very often they were having food together, meals together. And to, well, it says here in this translation to prayer, actually in the original it says to the prayers. And quite clearly, as we are going to hear in the very beginning of chapter 3, they continue to attend the prayers, the set times of prayer that were being held in the temple. Because that's where people gathered in faithfulness to God. That's the, the stable these people were all coming from. These were all uh, uh, Jews by background. Uh, as yet, they had no reason to suppose that they were to, in any sense, break with that background. Sadly, there were going to be some tensions in, in due course because not all the Jews would agree on this. And the Jewish fellowship, so to speak, would be, would be uh, seriously um, uh, uh, broken up, actually, by those who believed in Jesus, Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, and those who said Jesus most certainly was not the Christ. Jesus was most certainly not the Messiah. But at the moment, they were all keeping going to the prayers together. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't pray at home. In fact, again, in a sentence or two, we're going to have greatly strong suggestions that they would be praying at home as well. But there was nothing wrong with going to the prayers in the temple at the set times of prayer. Verse 43, everyone is filled with awe many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. It's just great, you know. At, at this time, the apostles, the book of Acts tells us, 
really were empowered to do extraordinary things, just as Jesus had been empowered to do extraordinary things. And of course, that's a great confirmation for everybody that these people were not messing around. These apostles truly were the first-hand witnesses of who Jesus had been. And uh, in the fullness of time, yes, sometimes wonders occur even now, yes. There are wonders and signs even now. At that time, it was the apostles who were absolutely able to do that. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. Now, sometimes this has been read as saying this is exactly how it was and how it should always be, that they absolutely pulled everything that they possibly had. They sold everything. I'm not sure the text absolutely says that. In fact, the, the instances that are given Remember, these are, as we're beginning, general words that are then going to be uh, uh, detailed in little instances that follow. And the instances that we hear about is that, you know, this person sold a field, and these people sold a field. It wouldn't necessarily have been all that they owned, but when it was needed, when there was needing to be sharing, when there were people who were too poor to manage themselves, Others were ready to step up. It's a great model, so important within the Christian faith that we support one another materially and not just spiritually. I'm very grateful, of course, as a minister that uh, the people uh, give money, not least so that I can conduct my ministry in a full-time way. But that's not the only way in which we can support one another materially. But uh, it's just, yeah, it's one of many examples. So people would sell property, they would sell possessions, if people were very much in need, of course. Why wouldn't we? Why shouldn't we? Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. There we are, have a, a little further detail of their meeting together for the prayers. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Always good to have fellowship. Always good to meet up with others in company. They would praise God, they would enjoy the favour of all the people well. The joy must have shone out of them. The delight and the, the love would have shone out of them. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There was something really big happening here. Day by day they were meeting. Day by day new people were hearing the gospel, responding with repentance and faith wanting to be part of this Jesus movement. Isn't that a glorious story of beginnings? But isn't it also a glorious story that might inspire us? And might we take heart and pray Lord, pray the Lord to allow that to continue to happen even in our day? I'm sure we should. One day, here's another example. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon, you see? Kept on going at the prayers. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I think almost nearly everybody who was there yesterday in the Bible study said, oh, we love this story. I think we all love this story, not least because it's got a great song that maybe we, we learned as children or we've been able to teach to children. But then we have two of the apostles, Peter and John, able to put into practice the very things that Jesus had himself done. Do you remember Jesus? So healed the lame, 
help them to walk. And here was a glorious moment of Peter and John being able to do the very same. The man thought all he was asking for, all he could possibly ask for, was money. But Peter says, no, 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 look at us, look at us, see who we are. And I need to be able to show you this, he says. The man gave them his attention, but Peter wants the man to hear what he says. Silver and gold I do not have. You may be asking for money, but money is not what I'm really able to give you. But what I can give you is this. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, isn't that an extraordinary way to describe Jesus? Usually he was Jesus of Nazareth. In the fullness of time, absolutely, or actually, well, already, clearly, they called him Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus God's anointed one. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. These eyewitnesses, they knew that Jesus was from Nazareth. They knew he was the Christ. And in that powerful name, in the name that showed that Jesus most certainly who had died, but who also most certainly had risen again, and whose risen power was now upon the apostles, in that precious name of Jesus, Peter and John said to this man, walk. And then they reached out their hands and the man was able to walk. And it's rather lovely the way it's told in verse 8, walking and jumping and praising God, or walking and leaping and praising God. There's almost a little echo of a text in Isaiah that the lame will leap and jump for joy. And people saw it. And again, wonder and amazement. What's going on? What's going on? Such exciting times. Well, the man himself was clearly a bit dumbfurnit, as we'd say in Scots. Well, the man held on to Peter and John, you know, holding on for grim life. <laughs> don't let me go. <laughs> I don't want to lose this capacity to walk. All the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. It's just a wee detail. They all remember that that's where it was. That's exactly where it happened. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Now, yes, you may be all looking at us, but listen, it isn't, it isn't that I have power. It isn't that I have special capacity to pray. What's happening here? is God at work. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The God who you have always been brought up to trust and that's why you have this temple, Peter is saying in Solomon's colonnade. The God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. So again, the story of Jesus is to be told because it was a story of Jesus that needed to get out there. The Jesus who many had rejected. The Jesus who many had thought was a waste of space and deserved to die. You handed him over to be killed, says Peter. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of so it's awesome the way he comes out with these glorious titles. I mean, who could not be ah, shaken by the thought that they had had in their midst the very Lord of all, and they'd allowed him to be killed. They'd had in their very midst the one who was sent from God, and they had not wanted to listen. So Peter is boldly confronting them, saying, listen, if you have, well, in modern, uh, in 2024, if you have only ever thought of Jesus as a swear word, if you have ever just thought, oh, these Christians are a waste of space, if you are needing to realise that actually you have got it so wrong, let me tell you, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Holy and Righteous One. Jesus 
is the author of life who was raised from death. And Peter and John were most certainly strong, strong witnesses of the resurrection. And they had been given that power for healing. And it's a wonderful thing when there is power for healing. Because obviously it helps confirm and strengthen people's faith. But Peter now spells it out. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. As you can all see. Very strong emphasis on how the name of Jesus and faith through Jesus is our way forward. Is our way forward whether we're physically lame or spiritually lame. Whether we have seen all that needs to be seen of the truth or whether we have been living blinkered, blind, lost lives. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed, that will completely heal. Now we haven't quite got to the end of this glorious speech, but that's as far as we got yesterday. And I think there's enough food for thought. Let's pray. And so, Lord, you are the one who brings healing and hope. You, Lord Jesus Christ, you are the one who will lead us into life, who will allow us to see more than we have yet seen. Open our, our, our ears, open our hearts, open our whole lives, that we may serve you, that our minds may be, renew may be renewed, that our passion may be to know you more. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen.